Hey guys, it's Vince. Today in this video, we're going to cover some features and wiring of a 2.2K VFD. Now, many of these um, sequences that I'm going to go through will be applicable to any size VFD, um, especially with the wiring. As far as the programming, um, again, your VFD may be different. It may not be different. If you have any questions, you can contact me. This is generalized around HY VFD. So again, um, I want to keep this video the least redundant as possible. There's a ton of videos online about you know programming and whatnot. I wanted to, to do a video on really a, a KISS method, keep it simple, stupid, so you guys are not only safe, but of course we're making it so your system will perform the way you're expecting it to. <clears throat> so first, time, first thing I want to cover real quick is let me go over what I'm doing right here. You can see the bundle of flat ribbon cable. This is actually the digital interface from the VFD. Um, for my client that had the large scale table that purchased it and then had that on-site service call, this is actually his system. I'm going over it now, setting it up for him. And while I'm in the shop, if I can kill two birds at one stone, make a video, give you guys some learning material, and then on top of that, uh, get accomplished what he needs done, it, it pays for itself all the way across the board. Um, so what I want to do is just cover real quick. We're using this cable to remotely mount his digital interface. I tell you guys this all the time, and the reason I love this cable is that's a 40-foot cable there. The reason you see it bundled like that is because once I undo the cable from its coil, I can't wind it up with the digital interface. So again, please excuse the wiring bundle, the rat's nest. It's, I assure you, only temporary. Um, but what we're looking at right here is exactly what you guys will typically see with your new VFD. Um, once again, the programming of this, I find it's easier to print out the programming steps because you can have it right there and go through it than to sit there with the video and hit stop and play and all that crap. Certain things are better off written and then you can validate when you're done. But what I'm going to cover right now really needs to be depicted in a good quality video. Um, the lighting situation right now in my shop is not the best. I'm trying to do my best uh, with illustrating everything. So if you guys do have questions, please ask. What I'm going to do now is pan over to the VFD unit itself because I want to cover the wiring. And before I do, guys, just to let you know what I'm using right here is an insulated screwdriver. These are for electricians or anyone working with electronics. Um, these are insulated to a thousand volt. I see a lot of guys on YouTube not using the proper tools. We always want to put our safety first, okay? Using this guarantees that you will not electrocute yourself, okay? This is 220 and it can be lethal very easily. So please always remember proper tools first. Now, as we go inside the unit, okay, and you can see here one of the big things I want to point out, I'm trying to get as much light in here as possible, so please excuse me. You can see we have our two grounds. We have, again, a W, a V, and a U. Of course, we have our two legs coming off the 110, which will be our uh, 220 coming into the unit, our neutral. Then we have our two grounds, and I get asked about the grounds all the time. Why we have two grounds coming from my spindle cable is the first ground comes out of the cable itself. The second ground comes from the shielding, of course. Okay, now your earth ground should, of course, be your wall outlet's third prong. If it's not, most likely your building or your actual residence isn't up to code in 98% of the country, so you'd want to look into that. But what you've got here is the proper way to dissipate EMI from this unit, because I'm telling you guys, when it comes to your system and stability, it must be done properly. I don't care if you hire an electrician, I've seen so many electricians. Uh, tell people really odd things. I have clients tell me all kinds of strange things. Um, I had a client last week tell me that his electrician said as long as a cable is shielded, it's effective. No, it is not. It must be dissipated properly, the EMI. And the only way to do that properly is when you have your ground from the shielding. And, and again, I soldered a silicone lead so it's extremely flexible. And then I came in here and attached it to the ground prong. Okay, once again, when you look at these connectors, one of the things I want you guys to really, really pay close attention to, again, is the detail work. None of these connectors are crimped. They're all soldered. Okay, and the reason I soldered them is because we want the least amount of resistance for this system. Okay, this, this form of electronics does not act as a typical wiring job, like I've said before, in stereo systems, uh, breaker boxes. This has to be done correctly because we're trying to reduce any side residual effect from EMI. Okay? So if this is not done properly and guys think I'm just being real anal, maybe that is. But I'll tell you what, 
I would rather have my system done with solder, heat, shrink, and flux and know that I'm reducing the resistance all the way around. Does it take more time? Yes. Does it pay for itself in the long run? Most likely because your system will be guaranteed that that's a variable we removed for any possible stability issues. Okay? Now as we come over here, I don't know if you can see that. I'm trying to get the camera in there with light. Let me see here if I can move the camera real quick. There's a terminal right here and this terminal is another ground. It actually has a ground symbol right there and that ground symbol and there's a ground symbol right here on this corner uh, post you can use these terminals to ground to. Okay? I see a lot of guys cross jumpering and doing all kinds of ridiculous things. You don't have to do that. Okay? R and S of course is your two 110 legs coming in. T is only used if you're using three phase. In this instance we're only using uh, the, the, the tandem phase there and what we've got over here is what you can see right here is a ground and that ground is now properly uh, grounded to the unit now again you only see one of these your power cord going to this unit should also be shielded okay a lot of guys are not doing that or at least I'm assuming they're not doing that because that's one question I don't get asked a lot on but let's use common sense if you're shielding the spindle cable we're using a high quality shielded spindle cable then we definitely want to shield the power cord coming in because we don't want any EMI leaking out of the power system. Now, what I'm using here, believe it or not, is a dryer cord. In this particular setup, for just my test routine setup, if this was going to the client, he's already got a pre-built, shielded properly cable, which is going to be properly drained to this ground lug. Okay? So you're basically going to have grounding and shielding on both ends. Okay? And when I say both ends, power coming into the unit, and then again, power leaving the unit to your spindle. Okay? This should make things extremely easy to follow. You guys can see here, with these circle ring connectors, your terminals are locked in. You never have problems. Now, I'm a big believer in using the soldering method instead of, you know, say a ferrule, if you can get away with it. If you're using heavy grade wiring, or even for terminal blocks like this, where you're using thinner grade wire, but you're never supposed to tighten these down ridiculously tight. I have a lot of guys that think, you know, you're not tightening lug nuts. I can't explain it any better than that. As long as you're making frictional contact, you're set. The big thing down here is that everything here is clean and neat. And again, you don't have the kind of meat that you would have on, let's say, a breaker box when you're attaching a breaker with one of these terminals. So being you don't have that kind of meat, you really just want to use that ring terminal because that ring terminal locks everything and keeps everything neat and you're safe and that is what we want is safety for you and safety for your property so coming over here you can see how the heat shrink is properly done you can see we've got just enough room to get our cabling in everything is neat and tidy as it should be spindle cable you needed a custom spindle cable this is a 30 foot double shielded my 16 4 um, these are monster cables guys in order to use this cable properly, you will have to Dremel out your actual, uh, the actual stress relief, okay? And that I'm fine with, just to let you guys know, don't be afraid to do that. It is a must, but when you get this cable done and it's done right, believe me, it pays for itself, okay? I have my computer right here. You can see that as well. And there's no static. Nothing is coming in here, and I did not even ground this end yet, which I should okay so that's telling us our EMI is very low right now believe me if there was issues you'd see static all over the PC and all kinds of issues so once again hopefully this has been helpful um, again as far as the, the actual settings and programming I'm gonna I'm gonna actually uh, offer you guys a Microsoft Word document with all of the settings that you can go through hit the ground running get your system programmed up print it out have it there when you're going to set things up to me I think that's the easiest method I've done it both ways where you're trying to do it with a video and this and that and I'll, I gotta be honest the, the printout makes it so easy you can sit there in the shop and just go through everything and you'll be golden okay so hopefully this has been very helpful now I want to come over here and just discuss some settings that I've never really seen discussed at least anywhere and realistically here's the digital interface you can see on the top of the unit you've got Hertz you've got reverse forward power of course a stands for amps a lot of you guys don't realize your unit you can actually tell how many amps the units pulling that's extremely useful information 
if you're machining a new substrate, preferably with an older end mill, and if you start noticing your amps are creeping up, that means usually you're not cutting as much, you're putting more force on the unit, and therefore that's something to pay attention to. ROT stands for rotation. You can switch the units from Hertz to actual RPM. Okay, and a lot of guys like RPM. This unit is already set to reflect RPM, being there's no motor hooked up. Um, we're not going to see that. But if you hit shift, now we're, we're searching, and right now we're on frequency. Okay, we can see our Hertz. It's lit, and you can see 124, and she's moving a little bit. As I go through it, now you see amps. And you see zero because, of course, we have no motor attached. When you attach a motor, guys, you'll typically see anywhere, if there's no load, 1.6, 1.5. I've seen them as low as 1.1. It just depends on where you're at. Overall, if you see an abnormal amp condition, pay very close attention to that. Okay? Don't be afraid if you're doing um, a, a new substrate and you're noticing, you know, you're trying different methods, maybe a new end mill or whatnot. Check the amp reading. Because the amp reading tells you the load you're putting on the motor. If it's cutting properly, the load should be lower. If it's not cutting properly, it'll be higher. Again, a lot of guys are nodding their heads. A lot of my older guys are, are understanding that. But a lot of the guys that are just getting involved with CNC, this is a really useful tool when it's used properly. Again, um, as we go through this, and I shift again, this is rotation. And this is going to tell you RPM. The way I've got this set up now and programmed, it will reflect RPM. So a lot of guys don't want to deal with reading in hertz. They want to deal with RPM, and I get that because that's the way I always go to as well. It's just easier. So, again, this is something to really pay attention to. You will have full instructions for these units to go through, and like I said, hit the ground running. Overall, why I love this unit, and I just got to point this out, why I love the remote mount. Oops, if I don't drop the camera. Why I love the remote mount is due to the fact that you can literally mount this anywhere you like within a 40 foot radius you don't have to worry about where the vfd's base mount is you don't have to worry about additional emi because you're going to properly ground and properly use shielded cable like you should and on top of that a lot of guys always want to look at the rpm or control their spindle for mach 3. i get that question all the time mach 3 does not have an encoder in it so you will be playing hit and miss to find the actual correct RPM of your system okay I'm not a big fan of playing hit and miss I like simple things this way you'll know the exact RPM and you can remote mount this you could put this right by your controller this is not going to do anything okay and you can make adjustments just as quick as setting in Mach 3 the difference is this is accurate okay not only is it accurate it's going to reflect amps Hertz you can forward and reverse everything and it's all remote mount more or less like a little pendant so, again, seeing it this way sometimes makes more sense when you see how everything is set up. And, again, I hope you guys have learned something from this because I really want these videos to be beneficial. I don't want to, you know, redundantly just keep doing videos that other people are doing just to get, you know, FaceTime. That's not what we're here for. I just want you guys to learn the right way and, and maybe open your eyes to some features that you may not have seen before. And, again, that AMP feature, bring it over again. Here we go. This amp feature, once that A is lit, and you see the amps that this spindle is actually pulling when she's hooked up, guys, pay attention to that. Okay? If there's a motor problem, if something doesn't sound right, you're going to know right here. If you record the minimal amps that your system's been pulling, when you're doing, let's say you're doing normal substrates that you've worked with for years, and you check and record that amp, and you say, okay, new end mill, this is what I'm pulling. If you see your amps going up dramatically, your motor is usually working twice as hard. And again, why do that to the equipment? We're trying to increase our longevity and again, be smarter with the equipment. This is a feature that should not be overlooked, okay? And again, the other features are, as far as I'm concerned, just icing on the cake. So again, hopefully this video has been very helpful and it's short and that's what I'm trying to do. Uh, if you guys have any questions on the wiring, you'll, you just gotta message me. Most of you guys already know that. Um, but as far as everything else goes, the main thing here, Let's take our time, make sure all of the wiring is done correctly. Want to make sure we're using ring connectors, solder heat shrink and flux, make sure connections real professional, and you guys will be golden, and you'll have that system be as rock solid as you're hoping to have. Okay?
once again to all my subscribers you guys are wonderful i love you guys we already had our first giveaway i'm really excited about that stan won the spindle he's got his spindle um, i hope he's enjoying it um, overall i'm planning on doing another sale this month i've got a lot of stuff planned i've got a couple new products i just got new shim stock in in house that's uh 304 stainless we get a lot of requests on shim stock so again i will be doing more videos it's just getting busier and busier all of you guys that have questions most of you have been extremely patient and i really do appreciate that if you do have questions message me if you have uh price price quotes that you need on certain components message me i'll do my best to get back with you and if we have to we can always schedule a phone call it's usually the fastest method again i don't try to make everything transparent guys i'm like you i'd rather just get on the phone we can solve the problem in an hour and make it right so once again i hope this video has been helpful i hope you guys have learned something and thank you all if you do need to get in touch with me once again just so you know my contact information is in the description it's storm2313 at gmail.com or you can go to my e dealers direct link both links will be down there and if you whatever you need just let me know and we'll take care of it thank you take care